Hello and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker. As much as we desire to live a life free of offenses and to walk in love, that isn't the norm for many. Over time, we build up defense mechanisms that are ready and waiting to be deployed as someone has stepped on a hidden tripwire. We use an emotional defense system made up of an arsenal of weapons like anger, denial, addictions, minimizing, intellectualizing, victimizing, and so much more. Our next guest says we don't have to live in a constant state of DEFCON 4. Steve Fair is the founder and director of Renewal Christian Counseling Center in Michigan. He received his master's degree in social work from the University of Michigan and a ministry degree from Morning Star Ministries. He provides cutting-edge clinical, medical, and spiritual interventions to those whose hearts are broken. You can read more about him at DividedHeartBook.com. Joining us now, as he does on the first Wednesday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour, is the author of Journey into the Divided Heart, Facing the, the, the Defense Mechanisms that Hinder Emotional Healing, Steve Fair. Steve, welcome to your edition of Journey into the Divided Heart. Thanks for having me, Rabbi. It's so good to see you again. It's good to see you, my friend. There, uh, <clears throat> uh, you're at home uh, in this uh, very odd state. I, I did an interview with uh, uh, somebody I've spoken to you about before, Dr. Mark Baker, that uh, is kind of the overcoming shame expert. And right in the middle of our discussion about social distancing. It's like I had this download from heaven that said, this is solitary confinement. Mm. This is something yeah. used in the penal system yeah. to punish. Yeah, torture. And it is, it is tortuous. And we now have a system where people like myself who are single socially isolated or really in kind of a solitary confinement environment. So now, true. if you play that out, you look at the psychology of the person who was in the, in the hole for a period of time. He comes out aggressive, angry, yeah. looking to take on, to vent, to unload all that's built up inside of him mm -hmm. while He's been deprived of human contact, interaction, maybe like Bonhoeffer, light. Um, uh, you know, uh, not Bonhoeffer, but um, name escapes me. Um, Voice of the Martyrs. But it'll, it'll, Richard, Rich, Richard Wombrandt. Mm -hmm. He was in solitary confinement complete abject darkness. Mm. So it's total, total sensory deprivation. Wow. So we don't have that sensory deprivation, but we have that human interaction. Uh-huh. Personal contact, personal touch. And uh, it's causing people to uh, Suicide, rage, uh, look at these riots in the streets uh, you, you have them there in Michigan. Sure do. We weren't wired to live like this. You know, you and I have often talked about the garden back, you know, Adam was in perfect paradise before the, our fallen state, before sin, before sickness. And God looked at him and he said, this, this isn't going to work. It's not good for man to be alone. And yet here we have a time where being alone is uh, and sometimes forced upon us. And we see all kinds of mental health issues going on inside. This is rattling our cages. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a shift that is punitive. Mm -hmm. It is um, <clears throat> the fallout from it, and I think the most affected area when we take a look at this is going to be the church. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, we've got so many pastors, priests, rabbis we're talking to you right now. They're depressed. They're discouraged. I, I've had one already on the phone this morning just... Um, 
he, he described it like Rocky IV. He said, you know, some people, I just keep getting hit. I just keep trying. I'm the cheerleader, and I just go down. It's part of me says, why don't you just stay down? So that's what they were telling Rocky when he was getting beat. He said, and I got to be honest, there's part of me that says, why do I keep getting up? I mean, this is the state of the battle that we're in right now. It's very discouraging, and people feel helpless. It's not natural. It's not good for our mental health. And what it does is it uh, it exacerbates, especially for the family unit, where life is built on you not being at home. Your mm. wife has a life. <laughs> She has order in her life. She's ordered her life with you getting up in the morning, whatever mm. interaction you two have, and you leaving. Mm. That's, that's part of her order. Mm -hmm. And now you're not leaving, and her order is upset. You're, you're okay because you're in the comfort of your home. You don't have to be in the office. You can do telemedicine. You can get up and enjoy. Uh, looking out the window and not having a bunch of staff bombarding you with issues. But for her, you're a disruptor. You, mm. you, you are a disruptor. Have you been talking to my wife, Rabbi? You've been uh, talking to my wife, haven't you? I, I, talk, <laughs> I talk to everybody's wife all, all the time. You're right, though. The whole structure of how we're, we're set up in our usual normal daily life, it, it's been tossed in the trash. And, and, and just when we, we're creatures of habit, aren't we? Just when we get used to the new normal, things change again. And every defense mechanism we know of is enacted right now. I guess, you know, just we could talk the politics of all this and the COVID side of it. But as we've been talking about my book, you know, this social isolation that's imposed on us now is even before all of this, sometimes back to our childhood, we have been socially isolating. We've been imposing this upon ourselves through all of the defenses and so many of us um, we realize we can be around people and still be completely alone because being isolated isn't just being away physically. It's is there a connection there? Are we connected heart to heart on a level of vulnerability and intimacy that God would call community? And the answer for a lot of us, not only now, but in our you know past, our history has been no. And these are, this is what we believe is the result of this is ongoing depression, anxiety, addictions, anger problems, relationship problems. This social isolation, whether it comes from politics, COVID, or our own defense mechanisms, uh, it's the end of us. It's, it's not our protection, it's our prison. You know, I'm single. I have a dog who is by my side all the time. <laughs> uh, she's a, a constant companion, but uh, even in the pulpit, even as a leading a congregation, you have to keep things at an arm's length. You can't get too close because it's, it's like you as a therapist. Okay, mm -hmm. As much as you would like to like the person and maybe have a friendship, mm -hmm outside of the practice, you can't do that. Mm. Not only is it against the standards of your profession, uh, mm. but you know the pitfalls and the, um, mm. the uh, spirit of familiarity, which, mm. which then causes lines to be crossed and, and uh, the uh, structure of uh, being able to receive from you as a professional begins to be eroded and you're mm -hmm. seen and cast in a different light. Most people mm -hmm. don't recognize that there's a man behind or a woman behind the minister and that person has to look outside of their flock. Uh, you know, sheep birth sheep. Shepherds don't birth sheep. So mm -hmm. you 
foster a community, but you're actually not a part of the community you've created. It's, it's very it's very disjointed when you really look at it. You mm -hmm. you preach unity, you preach community, you create mm -hmm. create areas and opportunities for there to be community, but mm -hmm. you are actually a visitor when you come to that activity mm -hmm. as the pastor, as the rabbi. Okay? Mm -hmm. You're not there as a as as, as as one of the gang. Yeah, that's rough. You've got to work the room, pay equal attention to everybody, make sure you don't slight anybody, you make the proper amount of eye contact, the uh, high fives, the hello, how are you's, and then you ultimately slip out and let them do their thing. And we wonder why pastors, priests, and rabbis have one of the highest depression rates, one of the highest suicide rates. Um, we are uh, part of a, a ministry to pastors here, and our, our stats are one out of every five quits the ministry in the first two to three years. That man was not meant to be alone. No. And it is, uh, you know, who, who do you talk to? You have, if you have a separate board, which is what I recommend that the board be an outside group. Uh, mm. You have a corporate board, which is an outside group of professionals and peers that are not engaged. Uh, you have a board within the congregation for congregational matters, but your corporate board, the one you are able to relate to the ones that become your inner circle are not members of the congregation. Mm -hmm. They're actually uh, outside of the congregation. So it, it becomes difficult because they have families, they have other sure. responsibilities, and you know they're board members and they have input, but mm -hmm. that's not in all cases relational. So mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to understand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And when you look at the those without families, and there's plenty of single people in ministry for by choice or by circumstance, uh, it winds up becoming a very challenging situation. Now you're thrown into this uh, shelter in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Skype and Zoom are not connections. Oh, no, for sure not. And what does the human heart do then when it's placed in an impossible circumstance like that, where part of your job, the setup of your ministry leads to aloneness? What does the human heart do when early on it's faced with lose-lose situations where I have lots of emotions, but there's nowhere to put those emotions, there's nowhere to express those emotions? What does the human heart do in in trauma? And that that's, that's what these defense mechanism studies are, are all about. We really want to normalize for people. Uh, pastors, clergy, priests included, especially right now, is to normalize that you're dealing with trauma the way the human heart deals with trauma. But the better we can understand this, the more we can get God's perspective on what does that protection really look like. I don't want to just follow the hard wiring of my defense mechanisms. I want to be spirit-led, not defense mechanism-led. And we're just seeing a lot of people come into a new level of freedom when they do that. It's interesting that when you, <clears throat> when you phrased it like that, I, I think about David's season of, uh, of silence the several years in which he did not hear from God uh, mm -hmm. after Bathsheba and Uriah and there was this relationship and there was this bre breach <clears throat> and all of a sudden God wasn't texting, God wasn't calling, God wasn't speaking. <laughs> uh, right. You know, what, what did he do during, the, during those two years um, we we can read of uh, what he wrote during mm -hmm. that period, and um, depressed. The it's one thing when the world 
is not interacting. But it's another thing when you're not in a relationship with God. Right. And right. you think God is being silent. And right. how many people are affected by this COVID-19 situation? Everybody virtually in the world. Mm -hmm. So sure. what is God saying mm -hmm. in this season and how do we process it? Mm -hmm. If everybody's asking the same question, Lord, why, Lord, when, Lord, how, Lord, what? They're all asking the same question. Is yeah. this is this judgment? Is this uh, preparation for something to come? Is this um, knowing the benevolence and the merciful heart of God? There has mm -hmm. to be something good that will come of it. Will it be the great awakening that everybody's hoping for uh, mm -hmm. when all this is finally lifted, that there will be many who turn back to the Lord, but statistically we're seeing many turning away yeah. from yeah. the Lord. Yeah, and that you know that's 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 one of the great questions through this is when people are isolated, especially as you're sharing, isolated from God. What's going on there inside when someone isn't hearing from God? What is happening there when they feel so disconnected from Him? And uh, you know, a lot are turning away from their faith because they would say that's a God issue. That's a God that doesn't care. That's a God that's distant. We have so many coming in agnostic these days, just say, oh, there might be a God, but he's, he's way out there in outer space somewhere. And I, I think theologically we can make the case that sometimes God is pulling back. But most of the time what we're finding is it's an, it's an us issue. It's not a God issue. God doesn't have issues. God isn't a distanced God. It's what's going on in Steve, what's going on in Rabbi, that I'm not able to hear the voice of a loving, close Father that's ever an ever-present help in time of need. You know, if we're a radio or a TV, maybe our, our antenna's disconnected. Maybe our, our Wi-Fi system is down inside. But maybe I have a part in that. Maybe there's something that Steve Fair did to disconnect. And one of the symptoms, one of the results is I'm not feeling close to people, but I'm also not feeling close or connected to God. You know, it's almost as if... <clears throat> We've hit this overload of uh, angst, of loneliness, of depression, mm -hmm. and uh, we have uh, withdrawn. We've unplugged. We've turned yeah. within. We we know that there's probably phone calls we could make to stay connected, but we just don't. Yeah don't have the desire anymore to make the effort. Mm -hmm. And so, if no, and, and if, if, if all parties are in the same position, then you have a phone that used to ring off the hook, doesn't ring at all. You have uh, emails and text messages that used to get from all kinds of people checking in and making yeah. plans, and now you have nothing. Yeah. And it's so... Um, falls in the category of trauma. Sure does. It's traumatic for a lot of people, and they don't have a prayer life. They don't have an outlet to write. They don't have the outlets and and the the freedoms. I'm I'm actually fine with alone has never been a problem for me. And so there's periods, there's moments of loneliness. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that's when I turn to the Lord. That's when I pray. Yeah. That's when I, you know, take the dog for a couple mile walk. And, and there you, go. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> you know, just take my mind off of it. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that it's natural, it's normal, and I'm fine with it. But for some, uh, this has been a, um, what would you say, a short circuit? Not an unplugging, but a crossed wire, if you will. 
and sure. the disconnect and the reconnect is when they plug back in, they plugged it in the wrong spot. Right. I mean, we've got some some um, examples like that. If you if you say, just say we're, we have a circuit breaker inside that when that trauma is greater than our capacity and you're sharing that you have capacity to be alone. Some some don't. Some this is so sudden. Think of our school kids that that's all they knew was sitting back next to 25 other kids every day, hanging out, having lunch, having recess. And now that's gone. They don't have capacity for that. That level of change and trauma trips the circuit inside that I believe that God built into us. You think of how our body's built. When there's an excessive amount of physical pain, we go into shock. Our body shuts down. I believe that's a, a merciful um, God that gave that mechanism that says, I'll never give you more than you can handle. I'll build into your system a measure when, when the pain gets so great, your body is just going to shut down. What a merciful, and yet we know that shock in itself can kill us, mm -hmm. right? What, what do we do when the body goes into shock? is we lay someone down and we raise their legs, right? We're trying to get blood flowing back to the heart. I, I, I think, you know, that same hap thing happens to us emotionally, that God has hardwired some circuits into us that flip when the pain is too great, when the trauma is greater than our capacity at that time in our life, whatever we might be going through. Thank God that we have that, that we, he won't give us more than we can handle. But we do need to raise the legs, get some heart, uh, some some blood pumping back to the heart, give our heart some attention. And the issue becomes for a lot that have been through trauma, how do I flip that circuit back on? What does that really look like? And for some, they don't want to flip that circuit back on because when we come back to, there still is a great deal of pain that needs to be walked through and healed from. You know, as we examine this journey into the divided heart and facing the defense mechanisms that hinder emotional healing, I think what you're talking about is is that um, reentry, um, mm -hmm. this process of reentry. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I at the, at the end of the Sabbath, mm -hmm. um, I would always uh, lead the congregation to what I would call re-entry. You know, now, now we've got to go back in, back into mm. the world. All right? mm. You know, mm. we've, we've separated the sacred from the carnal for a period of time to celebrate the Sabbath. Now we have to prepare ourselves for re-entry. But there's some who don't want. So what they do is they stay shut off. They kind of, they, they ju kind of jump, uh, they put a jumper cable in and they mm -hmm. sort of circumvent the process and mm -hmm. it winds up where they become somebody else. They, mm -hmm. they respond differently. They, they, I don't know if it's, if it's avoidance or uh, you talk about disassociation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important to reconnect it the way it was originally wired, which means mm -hmm. you have to go back and figure out what the the diagram, the schematic was, to know That's wh great where. Example. Where, so you go, you go pull all the all the all the wiring out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you put it back in the wrong place. Uh, you can do more damage and create a whole new persona, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, For sure. Multiple personalities. Mm. Uh, 
And as you're saying, the real sad thing there is, you know, wh whether it's the circuits are just off or the rewiring is, has happened wrong, that we are then not who God created us to be. We're built, we're made and, and created in His image. I reflect specific facets of who Father God is. You reflect specific facets. And uh, the people I talk to, they can tell when that's happening, but they can tell when that's not happening. They'll say, I just don't feel fully like myself. Something's just not right. Sometimes they're just saying, I, I don't know what my purpose is. But other times they're able to really go a little deeper and say, I just feel like something's missing in me. They're not living the wholehearted life that is the healed life, life to its fullest, as Jesus said. They know some part of them is missing. And uh, that's just a really sad thing for us, um, that we're not wholehearted, and then we're not able to walk out who we are and who we are in our communities. So let's get back to plugging back in. You know, it's very interesting, and I've been always try to be very, very transparent, but uh, I'm used to doing four live in-person events every week. Wow. So live, three hours of live TV daily and four live in-person events weekly. When that was cut away back in March and everything shut down, yeah. we didn't know how long it was going to last. Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of a a break and we we here in the studio worked on developing our new platforms and apps and we got to focus some attention in some developmental areas which mm -hmm. will serve us in the long term. But mm -hmm. then there reached a point when I realized that I wasn't getting my fix, my validation, mm. my mm. my confirmation of my calling mm -hmm. and I went into a period of time questioning if I was still called mm -hmm. because I wasn't getting that response that facial that in person and, and yeah. in, in front of a group uh, I'm very different than I am sitting here in the studio mm -hmm. uh, it's dynamic it's interactive it's it's uh, expository it's spontaneous it's mm -hmm. it's comical and it's it's interactive and it's much more animated than it is sitting here mm -hmm. in, in a studio sure and I began to realize that uh, not having that was pushing me to the point of saying well without that if I don't have that confirmation that feedback that interaction am I still called to minister Mm. Yep. Some deep questioning going on in, inside of you. That was trauma for you. It still is. Mm-hmm. You know, mm. we're, we're, we're still canceled with no expectation until sometime next year of us being able to start back up. Yeah. You know, that's an, an open-ended, it could be a full year, and then what does it look like after a year of absence? Can you put it back together again? Yeah. yeah. So it's the unknown <clears throat> compounded by the unknown. Mm -hmm. And hey. what do you do when you have no control? Mm -hmm. That's right. And we have some scriptural examples of what we do with that, including Jesus that just would say to Father God, here's what I'm feeling. I don't I don't want to take this cup. I don't I don't want to do this. I'm overwhelmed unto death. I'm heavy laden. We have you brought up David. David said, Why are you downcast, O my soul? We stay plugged in enough to feel those emotions, to walk through those emotions, but not alone. We walk through those emotions hand in hand with a loving God who compassionately feels what we feel. 
Absolutely. We're and talking. That, that's the trick, except when these circuit breakers break, all of that shuts down. And here we've got trauma on top of trauma. It's certainly, in, from a clinical standpoint, there are some things that happen in response. One of the defense mechanisms uh, being disassociation. And we're going to talk about that when we return from break. We're talking with Steve Fair as we do on the first Wednesday of every month in the 10 o'clock hour. He's the author of Journey into the Divided Heart, Facing the Defense Mechanisms that Hinder Emotional Healing. You can find out more at dividedheartbook.com. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about one of the major defense mechanisms that uh, kicks in with trauma is disassociation. What does that mean? What's it look like? Are you experiencing it? Are you with someone who's experiencing it? Do you recognize it? Does it mm. explain what's happening to you? Mm. Does it help mm. you understand that it is a defense mechanism and something that needs to be addressed and healed? We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and my special featured guest twice per month with Rabbi Zeb Parat and Carl Gallops, and monthly with Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Dr. Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Dr. Jeffrey Johnson, Drs. Michelle and Mark Sherwood, Dr. Kim Moss, Derek Gilbert, Peter Rosenberger, Brandon Gallops, Steve Fair, Stephen Black, and Sean Tabbitt for in-depth insights into Israel, prophecy, the unseen realm, the brain, spiritual warfare, overcoming shame, mysteries of the Bible, prophetic insights, the sensational and the supernatural, caregiving, addiction recovering, understanding the divided heart, same-sex attraction, and much more. We're proud to feature some of the greatest biblical minds from both Israel and around the United States. Check out our featured guest lineup and 24-7 feed on IgnitingAnation.com or watch by topic on any device with our free apps. If you can't find what you need, you're just not looking in the right place. Follow us on social media and download our free apps today. With today's smartphone technology, News, information, sports, and entertainment is widely available and almost unbounded. But what about the information that believers in Yeshua are looking for? Well, now there's an app for that. Igniting a Nation now has apps available for Android and iPhone. With our app, you'll gain access to everything you would in our website, from our featured guests to our live streaming shows. Visit Google Play or the Apple Store and download Igniting a Nation's new app today. Shalom. I'm Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, inviting you to join me and Israel's number one rated guide, Edo Kanan, for our annual Israel trip. Our 2022 trip is now open for registration for our 18th trip to Israel. Our trip will take us from Tel Aviv to the Galilee, down to the Dead Sea, and four nights in Jerusalem. You will walk where Yeshua walked and watch the Bible turn from black and white to living color. Visit ignitinganation.com forward slash events and download the registration form today. No, it's not too early to take advantage of our payment plan designed to fit any budget. All of our trips sell out and we want you to experience this life-changing journey. Registration is now open for April 2nd to 13th, 2022. And we promise you, you will never read your Bible the same way again. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, Messianic Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Steve Fair. As we do at the 10 o'clock hour on the first Wednesday of every month, he's the author of Journey into the Divided Heart, Facing the Defense Mechanisms that Hinder Emotional Healing. Steve, welcome back. Thank you so much. So now we're going to hone in on this particular defense mechanism called disassociation. What is disassociation? How does that look? How does that manifest? And what are, if, 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 if it is a defense mechanism, it's good 
for a period for what it was designed to be used for if God gave it to us, mm -hmm. but only for that period. Correct. And if we stay too long in it, it then becomes a defining factor as Correct. to who we are. And control is now moved into a would this be a spirit of disassociation? Mm. Yeah, we've definitely seen that. And uh, as you and I have talked, I, I cut my teeth on, on this pr particular defense mechanism by working with a full caseload of those that were fully diagnosably disassociated and in its extreme we used to call this multiple personality disorders it's called disassociative identity disorder now but to see how the human brain and, and mind and heart is programmed um, to protect itself when the pain is too much to split literally into different alters psychology would call that but um, it, yeah, we, we really look at this as a continuum. If you're asking, what is disassociation? Um, that is the minority, um, the strong minority of people, the majority of us that manifest this defense mechanism. We just call it unplugging. You know, disassociation, meaning not associated, not connected. There's an emotional place inside that when the circuit breaker uh, clicks, We've just unplugged from our heart, and the symptoms of that are can be as subtle as just feeling a little checked out, you know, being a little spacey or a, a numb kind of a, a blank feeling inside, forgetfulness. Um, yeah, that's a, a huge part of it. I just can't remember where my keys are. <laughs> that's me every morning. Thank God for my wife. She reminds me where they're at. Where my, where's my wallet? Where's my phone? Um, the benign example of disassociation, and I think we can all identify with this, is something's on your mind and you're driving down the road. And before you know it, you've went through three, four, five stoplights but you don't remember if that stoplight really was green. <laughs> was it red? You don't hear sirens. You're, you're still driving, so you didn't get in an accident. But who was driving that car? It was the body of Steve Fair, but his mind was off somewhere else. And we can all identify uh, with some of that. Some of us daydream. We fantasize, but that means we're unplugged. We, in our mind, are somewhere else out there. Well, our conscious um, what daily functioning side of who we are is uh, attending to another task. And that is a God-given defense. I'm so glad we have it. But we can all see how that can become very disruptive in day-to-day -day life. So is it safe to say that as we look at these defense mechanisms, that God has given us an arsenal of defense mechanisms for dealing with particular situations that could be harmful. But if we go too far with any of them, that if we strike a false balance with any of them, and they begin to define us as opposed to us uh, using them as they were designed to be used. Uh, so true. And I just really encourage people, get the book, Divide, Journey into the Divided Heart. I have um, numerous testimonies and stories just that we tell on a real practical level. Those that have healed from this, their stories, their testimonies, those that are in the middle of healing from this, what it feels like to them, what reconnecting feels like, and, and the pros and cons to that. But real life examples in our book and what we really want to stress to people is this isn't one of those de defense mechanisms that you chose consciously to use 
the the psychology of this is this is a hardwired frontline first string defense mechanism that happens usually when we've had trauma before the age of eight. So that's not something that someone sat down and said, "Boy, I'm feeling crummy today. I should, I should have a drink. I should smoke. I should whatever addictions. This, this not like that. It's a switch that flipped. And as you're saying, people will just kind of notice as we're talking about this that I have some of those symptoms. They'll notice that maybe my circuit breaker is still unplugged. Maybe there's some things that we didn't necessarily choose to use this defense, but now we can choose to stop using this defense. We really want to empower people that that is, is possible, that we see God doing that every day. So let, let's see if we can come up with a real example. Somebody, either a story from the book or uh, without naming anybody, kind of talk about this process of what kind of trauma would trigger such a long-term later in life impact that, <clears throat> yeah. that manifests itself in your teens, maybe in your adulthood, uh, right. maybe even in your 40s and 50s and, and something seems to break but it was already broken. That's right and it can be the, a wide array of traumas. You know when we say trauma I, I, I think a lot of people um, go right to their definition of emotional trauma would be sexual abuse, would be physical abuse, would be being raised in maybe a war-torn country or a part of the country there was a lot of poverty and that is true except what we would say is any a trauma is anything that's greater than your capacity to handle at the time if you think of age eight and before it takes that but a lot less we don't have a capacity to handle um, different levels of pain. Sometimes it can be as subtle or as slight as losing your best friend, as grandma dying, as your pet running away, a house fire, um, a divorce with your, your parents, moving across the country. I mean, these are the things that are higher level changes in our life that if we don't have the capacity to handle disassociation or just unplugging and checking out is a frontline defense that might have happened to you to our, our listeners it doesn't have to be something that just happens with these higher level um, type B we would say bad things that happen to you in your life so we could tell stories all day, Rabbi. I don't, uh, Rabbi. I uh, it, it, they're in the book. I'll tell you one quick one just to illustrate the the side of the spectrum of DID that you'll read this in in my book, and it's quite difficult to write about because I'm talking to a lady that came in for marriage counseling, and we're asking God where this anger came from. And up comes this memory in inner healing prayer. God took her there, not Steve Fair, of being sexually abused. And as she starts to just be flooded with the emotion of that memory that she hadn't thought about for years, I describe in my book how another altar came forward. We'll call them protector altars. And said to me in a whole different tone, in a whole different mannerisms, different look in her eyes, she said to me, who the H are you? And uh, not trying to be vulgar with my language, but just a great shift. She was angry and she was going to protect and I had to describe, I'm Steve, I'm the counselor here, we were praying. This part said to me, she's, she's not going to go there. This is not a good idea. This memory, we put this in the past a long time ago, except, Rabbi, she didn't, and most of us didn't. We think we put it in the past, but we're triggered and heightened in these areas throughout our, our whole life. And the story goes, that as that protector stood to the side, then we saw some other parts, some that were living in the middle of that trauma, 
you know, we don't track time in the right side of our brain. So a lot of the places in us that we store trauma, it feels like we're still in that trauma. And these altars, this part was still living reality of that trauma every single day. And so, you know, a number of these parts, one other part came out and said she just laid there. She was mad, mad at herself. But we can talk about compartmentalizing how we just the fight side was here. The flight side was here. The freeze side was here. These took on different altars to handle. And that's what DID is like. And how do we heal from that is each one of those parts got to meet an encounter Jesus and what he might have to say, what he might have to minister. That's how we see the integration of the divided, broken heart on that level is they all come into Christ. In Christ, we are one and we are whole. And we just have some amazing testimonies that God can heal the most broken of the broken hearts. Steve, if if you were not familiar to me and you were describing this to me mm -hmm. on the phone and saying I have someone who I'm talking to who's manifesting different personalities I would say that um, <laughs> do each, does each personality have a name and they most certainly do I would and I would go right to the demonic and uh, take a look at the name of the spirit. So, who, you know, who who am I talking to? Mm -hmm. The same way Jesus said, "What what are you? What what is your name?" Well, our name is Legion, for we are many. So, yeah. is this on the fine line of psychology and? spiritual demonic oppression so if they're a believer if the, if the host I'm trying to, to to put it in the the counseling terminology if the host uh -huh. if, the, if, the, if the host is a believer uh-huh uh, then technically can't be possessed but can be oppressed. Mm. So are these oppressive spirits taking on identities that are named and have mm. characteristics and are operating, appearing to be the defender, but in fact are a protagonist. In yes. fact, they are <laughs> dangerous to the mental health of the host. So that's yeah. not that's not of God. Yes, yes, yes. And and I sympathize with you and every other you know uh, person watching. This messes with our theology. It brings up a lot of questions. Is this demonic? Is this too much psychology? I, I didn't ask for this ministry, and yet I, it's one of my most blessed. Um, I just feel so honored to go there with people. But I'll just tell you from my experience, find someone that's done this before. If you at all, any of our listeners, have symptoms like this, go to someone that has experience with disassociation because many of us, me included early on, we couldn't tell the difference between a demonic stronghold and an altar. Sometimes they present similar. I got into ministry to the occultic, the people that come out of satanic ritual abuse that were programmed with demonics to control them that would look like altars. And I've had altars that look like demonics and protect tend to be demonics, but that whole world is 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 very stirring for us to even talk about. I only bring it up to help people see that that is how God hardwired us. And there is a percentage of our population that we honor you and there is healing for you. The rest of us that are just checking out, we're kind of 
blank. You know, you know that look when you see on the the nightly news a whole group of refugees that they're just coming from a bombing, they're homeless, and they just have that blank look in their eyes. That's the look I think the majority of us that have dissociation will manifest more on that level that we're just unplugged. That's a person that just went through such trauma that they're not feeling any emotion. They're numb. You know, a lot of our uh, marital couples come in for marriage therapy and they'll just say, I can't connect to my husband or my wife. And you can see it in their eyes. It's not a wall as far as that person won't talk to their husband or wife as much as it's a circuit breaker that's been turned off for a long time that they need to see their numbness is disassociation, their forgetfulness, and their relationships aren't going real well. I just encourage them to read our book, go through the questions, read the testimonies, acknowledge that maybe that's something that you have on a greater or lesser level on the spectrum. And there is healing for this, activating our free will to say, God, I choose you as my defense mechanism. I thank you for disassociation in my past. It served me well. It's not serving me well now. Now I know you. You're my great protector. I renounce this as a defense, and I replace it with you. Amen. Amen. I pray right now that... There yes. are many who are hearing, hearing this and yes. have just been released, just recognized that yes. this is what they've been going through and yeah. that they are going to plug back in. They are, re they are going to reconnect and yes. be intentional about t unplugging this this connection that's been disconnected and putting mm -hmm. it in the right plug it's a, it's the it's the moving it from the switch that's the the plug that's the dead plug it looks <laughs> plugged in okay, yep. but there's no power to it that's right okay? and you can have the top one works but the bottom one doesn't mm -hmm. and you're plugged in the bottom one and now we're going to unplug that and plug you in the top one and the energy is going to come back and the connection is going to start to come back and the lights right. are going to go on and all of a sudden life begins to flow because mm -hmm. blood flows. It's the same as the shock that in the body. When the blood starts flowing back, then the organs start pumping and life comes back. We've been talking with Steve Fair, author of Journey into the Divided Heart, facing the defense mechanisms that hinder emotional healing. Today we talked about disassociation being one of those major defense mechanisms, hardwired in us as a gift from God to serve us for a time, a purpose, and a season, but not for us to live in. And we have to recognize that any of these defense mechanisms that God has given us that begin to overtake our lives, that begin mm -hmm. to control us past their point of usefulness as God designed them, yes. need to be addressed and dealt with. And restoration, healing can come, but only through a personal relationship with the Messiah yes. and a professional to guide you through the process. And we strongly encourage you to ask for help. Yes. Ask for help. Yes. And if you don't know if you need help, ask the person sitting next to you. <laughs> and say, honey, do, do you think I need help? <laughs> and be transparent and don't let your feelings get in the way. And if you hear, I've been waiting 27 years for you to ask me that question. <laughs> right? then just thank them for being honest and go out and get some help. You'll Amen. thank Steve Fair, you'll thank me, thank and you'll you. most certainly thank the Lord. Steve Amen. Fair, always great to be with you, my friend. Don't great forget DividedHeartBook.com, and uh, you can always find his book on our website, IgnitingAnation.com. We will see you on the first Wednesday of next month at the 10 o'clock hour for the next edition of Revealing the Truth, a Journey into the Divided Heart. Steve Fair, always great to see you. Have a wonderful, spectacular, and blessed holiday season.
You too, my friend. Thank you so much. God bless. We're going to take a short break. In a moment, come back. We'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.